Gene Ovenick with Hoof Care Today. I'm going to expand a little bit on what is the proper hoof angle. And I think before we get into that, we, we have to first of all recognize because of the interest that people have in that, we see a variety of different hoof shapes. Some seemingly have a low angle, some have a more upright angle. And uh, horse owners are always concerned about that, and veterinarians, farriers are, it's always a topic of discussion. So it's a good question. And we we'll touched on it a little bit in a, in a smaller segment, but the thing that I think is important that we understand uh, what is involved in, in the differences in these angles. And there's very little control that we have, at least as an adult horse, in what the angle of that foot is. And to just simply throw them into the same box and say, well, this ho these horses should have, because of their breed type, for instance, they should have a certain angle, is actually the virtual creation of a lot of lameness issues and performance issues as well. So I think I'm going to try to describe to you uh, from the beginning what happens and what is the creation of this, uh, of this differences in horses' feet. Foals are born and they possess, as people do in all animals, have a, uh, a growth plate section of each bone. And uh, that's to accommodate for maturity as the, as the animal, humans, or whatever get larger, the bones enlarge themselves in length especially. And uh, because of that, it, uh, it enables the bones to grow along with the body. And so once the uh, growth plates reach their full maturity, and in horses it's in the distal limb, for instance, up as far as the knee, they're, they reach their growth very close to the two-year-old age. That's a part of, of what controls the actual hoof shape. Because the ligaments that control the length of the tendons uh, are a part of this bone lengthening process, whether it's genetic or developmental makes no difference. What you have at the end of a two-year-old year is what you're stuck with for the rest of that horse's life. And does that mean that it's bad? No, it's in changing these hoof angles, trying to make them the same is where the destructive part of that comes in. And we see that frequently with horses that are, are trying to be manipulated in getting the flatter foot to take the same shape as the more upright foot because of the tensions on those two feet. We see horses stand with one foot forward and one foot behind, trying to equalize those tensions. And it's important from the standpoint of a horse at rest, and that's how I think you have to approach this. The design of the horse was, was such that equal tension on the extensor tendon and the flexor tendon that, is, that are controlled by a, uh, by a secondary ligament that's attached to the bone controls their virtual lengthening process. So if the foot is in equal tension, the horse can stand with his feet straight down and straight across and rest comfortably. If the tension is disturbed, then they have to alter their stance. And I want to explain to you a little bit about how that works. I'm going to use this uh, perpendicular line as a, as a model. The coffin bone is, let's say this is the front of the coffin bone, this is the bottom of the coffin bone. The extensor tendon that comes down the front of the leg attaches to this part, the top part of the uh, coffin bone. And, there's, uh, and this, of course, is inside of the hoof capsule and the bottom plane next to the sole. The deep flexor tendon comes down the back of the leg over the navicular bone and attaches perpendicular to the attachment of the extensor tendon. Now, if, if you, as a farrier or a trimmer, arbitrarily raise the angle of the foot by leaving some heel, you're going to shorten this distance here that's, that's, eventually, that's inevitably attached to a bone up here in the cannon bone. And you're going to lengthen, then stretch the uh, extensor tendon that's attached to another bony structure high in the leg. So uh, realizing that both of these 
upper attachments are attached to bone that has been determined by the growth plates and the given length is, has been determined at a two-year-old age, when you arbitrarily take and lower the heels or raise the heels, you can, you're interfering with this equilibrium here. And I realize that's a very complex thing, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to conclude and give you some simple reasoning behind this in time. But let's say you drop this heel, you're going to lengthen this, increase the tension on this, and lessen that. So the horse has to, if he's expected to sleep comfortably standing, he's going to have to move the foot either forwards or backwards in order to establish this equilibrium. Now, if they have to alter their stance um, in the front, they're going to have to alter their stance in the back. That's going to create some sort of a body curve that may, if they're relaxed, their muscles are then not going to be in complete harmony over their back. And it's a very complex thing, but look at it from that perspective. Another thing that horse owners recognize in, when the feet are manipulated and are tried, trying to put them into the same frame, uh, if there's vast differences between the upright and the flat foot, Horses, not only do they stand comfortably, but they move differently. And we hear this from a lot of owners that often give uh, credence to a poor fitting saddle or a bad acting horse, meaning they don't want to turn one direction as willingly as they do to the other. Well, when you get right down to it, it's about the equilibrium of the foot. And if each foot had been prepared to its own likeness and to what its intentions were in, from a tension standpoint, the horses perform more efficiently and they're, they're not so inclined to favor one side over another. It's the same thing when they stand. One foot forward, the other foot back, that's their preference. They're going to respond in a similar way when they're under saddle. And because the body tends to take an irregular shape because of how they stand and sleep, it has a reflection on how they perform. So the problem becomes very complex over a period of time. And I think that what we as individuals and caretakers need to understand is there's nothing we're going to be able to do about the foot that's developed in a different state, meaning you can you can't expect that upright foot to look like the flat one or vice versa. I think what horse owners need to go away with is that first of all, the feet are not alike in nearly all horses. They may seem similar in some respects, but there's always seems to be some differences, very much like people. And to treat them, put them into the same box is not a good idea. Using a hoof gauge can be very misleading and often is the very catalyst for why horses get lame because it addresses the outside of the foot and not the inside where the true biomechanics are. The nice thing is, is that the format that, the, that we have come up with with the ELPO gives us that information. Looking at the foot from the bottom, from the widest part of the foot, dividing it up equally from front to back, still gives us the best approach to dealing with each foot as an individual. And it seems to suit most of our performance issues, our stumbling issues, and our lameness issues that uh, apply to the differences in the feet. Mm -hmm.